Howdy. Howdy. Awesome. I love it. Um, we're so glad that you're here because we're going to go into the desert. And the desert has a flashback for me because it takes me back to August of 1990. So this is quite an experience for me to participate in tonight and reflect back on things that happened during a very significant time in our country's history. I welcome all of you to the campus of Texas A&M University and the Bush School of Government and Public Service and the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs. Uh, this event is a wonderful event where we get to celebrate the success of one of our former faculty members, but we also get to welcome the C-SPAN audience who is uh, C-SPAN is covering this event, and it'll be broadcast on C-SPAN, so we say welcome to all of the C-SPAN uh, watchers, and we welcome all of you to this fabulous event. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a host in Fred McClure, and the, the Bush Foundation, who has made this facility available for us to, to meet in, so thank you, Fred. Uh, we also have to welcome Warren Finch, who is taking care of the library and museum where President Bush's historical records are all kept and the story of his life can be seen by touring the museum. Uh, so we thank the, uh, the Bush Presidential Museum and Library. And we also have a special person here who takes care of President Bush. And that's President Bush's Chief of Staff, Gene Becker. So thank you very much. And President Bush is doing really, really well. And he's very anxious to come back to Texas A&M University and, and the campus of the Bush School. So thank you, Gene. And please give our best to President Bush. <laughs> Dr. Jeffrey A. Engel is the founding director of the Presidential History Project at Southern Methodist University. Until the summer of 2012, he served as the Verlin and Howard Cruzy, fifth class of 52 at A&M, founders a professor at Texas A&M University in the Bush School. So we're pleased that the Cruzies are here as well. Thank you very much for the support that you've given to Jeff Engel and to the Bush School and Texas A&M. Uh, when Jeff was here at Texas A&M, he was the director of programming for the Scowcroft Institute, and he is a graduate of Cornell University. He additionally studied at St. Catherine's College, Oxford University, and received his PhD in American History from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he served as an Owen postdoctoral fellow in international security studies at Yale University. His books include Cold War at 30,000 Feet, The Anglo-American Fight for Aviation Supremacy. He received a pre pretty significant award for that book. He won the biannual Paul Birdsell Prize from the American Historical Association for his outstanding work in European military and strategic history. He wrote Local Consequences of the Global Cold War, uh, published by Stanford University Press in 2008 and The China Diary of George H.W. Bush, The Making of a Global President, published by Princeton University Press in 2008. Rethinking Leadership and Whole of Government National Security Reform with one of our Bush School faculty members, Joe R. Sarami, and that was done for the Strategic Studies Institute in 2010. And he wrote The Fall of the Berlin Wall, The Revolutionary Legacy of 1989, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2009. Obviously, we miss him at the Bush School, but he know he's doing well up at SMU. I would now like to suggest that we're going to have a pre-introduction to Dr. Jeff Engel coming up on stage. And before he brings his remarks, we're going to see a video. And this is a pretty significant video because it's a video in President Bush's own words and it chronicles the events following the invasion of Kuwait. And I would like you now to pay attention to this video, and after it's over, we'll have Jeff Engel come up and talk to us. Thank you very much. In the early morning hours of August 2nd, following negotiations and promises by Iraq's dictator Saddam Hussein not to use force, 
A powerful Iraqi army invaded its trusting and much weaker neighbor, Kuwait. Within three days, 120,000 Iraqi troops with 850 tanks had poured into Kuwait and moved south to threaten Saudi Arabia. At my direction, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, as well as key units of the United States Air Force, are arriving today to take up defensive positions in Saudi Arabia. No one, friend or foe, should doubt our desire for peace, and no one should underestimate our determination to confront aggression. Our objectives in the Persian Gulf are clear. Our goals defined and familiar. Iraq must withdraw from Kuwait completely, immediately, and without condition. These goals are not ours alone. They've been endorsed by the United Nations Security Council five times in as many weeks. Most countries share our concern for principle and many have a stake in the stability of the Persian Gulf. This is not, as Saddam Hussein would have it, the United States against Iraq. It is Iraq against the world. May I say that I just had a very useful meeting with His Highness the Emir, and I reiterated the total commitment of the United States to the objectives that are enshrined in 10 United Nations Security Council resolutions. We agreed on the desirability that these objectives be realized peacefully. At the same time, we also agreed that all options remained open and that steps needed to be taken right now. Soldiers of the 18th Airborne Corps, Commander-in-Chief. Over the past four months, you have launched what history will judge as one of the most important deployments of Allied military power since 1945. And I have come here today to personally thank you. The world is watching. I've spoken with the Secretary of State, Jim Baker, who reported to me on his nearly seven hours of conversation with the Iraqi Foreign Minister, Tarek Aziz. Now, Secretary Baker made it clear that he discerned no evidence whatsoever that Iraq was willing to comply with the international community's demand to withdraw from Kuwait and comply with the United Nations resolutions. Let me emphasize that I have not given up on a peaceful outcome. It's not too late. The choice of peace or war is really Saddam Hussein's to make. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Ground forces are not engaged. Participant. Israel is not a combatant, and this man is elected to, uh, to uh, launch a terroristic attack. When the Soviet Union made such a strong statement, that was very reassuring, and uh, we are in close touch with our coalition partners, and this coalition is not going to, uh, going to uh, fall apart.
Now, with remarkable technological advances like the Patriot missile, we can defend against ballistic missile attacks aimed at innocent civilians. I have therefore directed General Norman Schwarzkopf, in conjunction with coalition forces, to use all forces available, including ground forces, to eject the Iraqi army from Kuwait. The liberation of Kuwait has now entered a final phase. I have complete confidence in the ability of the coalition forces swiftly and decisively to accomplish their mission. Kuwait is liberated. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. Kuwait is once more in the hands of Kuwaitis in control of their own destiny. We share in their joy, a joy tempered only by our compassion for their ordeal. We went halfway around the world to do what is moral and just and right. We fought hard, and with others, we won the war. We lifted the yoke of aggression and tyranny from a small country that many Americans had never even heard of, and we asked nothing in return. We're coming home now, proud, confident, heads high. There is much that we must do at home and abroad, and we will do it. We are Americans. May God bless this great nation, the United States of America. Thank you all very much. Dr. Jeffrey Engel. Howdy. 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 Okay, I gotta tell you, uh, I miss a lot of things about Aggie Land. Uh, it's been about two years since I've been back. I miss the students. I miss the barbecue. I miss the football, especially this last year. Uh, I really miss a howdy. <laughs> so this, as I mentioned, is my first visit back to the Bush School in about two years. And I have to say it's really hard not to feel completely overwhelmed by the memories. In every possible way, the Bush School provided a home. Our kids were born here in College Station, and it will forever be part of our lives and our history. And in fact, in my mind, the school gave me nothing less than a career as well. It also provided, I should say, wonderful colleagues, ever eager to debate ideas while training the next generation of public servants. Now, I should note that several of my favorite colleagues were also ever eager to explain to me in great detail, oftentimes with charts and graphs and long equations, exactly why my own methodologies were deficient. Uh, I wish Professor Gawandi was here, actually, <laughs> as I say that. And these debates helped sharpen our argument, and in fact, they really proved the value of good colleagues because the best kind of colleagues are those who care enough to argue with you to help you get it right. And so I really do thank my colleagues, especially for my time here. Uh, indeed, personal relationships really defined our time here in Aggieland. In fact, I think back on all the deans and administrators who led the way of the Bush School as it grew. From Chuck Herman, uh, who called me at 11.45 on a Saturday night to offer me a job, and to our, my first dean here, General Dick Chilcote, 
who upon hearing what it would take to bring a couple of Yankee historians down to Texas, said simply, and I hear quote, hoo <laughs> uh, He then hung up the phone, leaving me to wonder exactly what he meant, uh, but more importantly, if he was ever gonna call back. Uh, he did, and he came through, as did other deans to follow, including Benton Kokenauer, who is a wonderful example of a dedicated academic administrator, and of course, Ryan Crocker, who epitomizes public service. And then there's Andy Carr. Let me say a quick word about Andy, since I have the mic. Uh, the Bush School is deeply and profoundly fortunate to have Andy Card at the helm. We only overlap briefly here in Aggieland, to my great regret. <clears throat> Yet in that short time, I discovered the man who, more than any other that I've met in my life and career, a man with great power, great intellect, and uh, great substance, who was also a truly great gentleman. So you're lucky. Actually, come to think of it, there is one other person who combines a great sense of power and leadership with being a true gentleman, and the entire school is named after him. But I realize, of course, you did not come here tonight to hear me go down memory lane, much though I would love to keep going that way. We come here instead to launch a book, fruit of the Skokoff Institute's research program. It's an edited collection which explores a variety of interpretations and analyses of the Gulf War, its place in history, its meaning. The book began as part of the school's 20th commemoration of that Gulf War, and under Larry Knapper's excellent leadership, his Scowcroft Institute gathered together eminent scholars, policymakers, journalists, charging each with providing their own unique perspective on the Gulf War, not only what it meant to them, but more importantly, what it meant within the longer arc of history. They talked about politics, military affairs, diplomacy, relations between the Muslim and the Western worlds, and ultimately what that all meant for the time and for the future. Now I admit to you here that I'm quite biased, but I think that this is that rare collection of essays that is more than just the sum of its parts. For the essays actually speak to each other, at times actively disagreeing with each other. And giving a book talk, a book launch talk, about an edited collection is, of course, therefore, no easy thing because each of our contributors tell their own story and make their own argument far better than I could, in my words. So therefore, tonight, I'm going to spend the remainder of my time giving you my perspective on the Gulf War and what it meant. For it's been, obviously, 20 plus years since the tumultuous events just demonstrated in the video. And much has changed over that time, yet much remains the same. Saddam Hussein, of course, is gone and Kuwait remains independent. Yet American forces remain enmeshed in the Persian Gulf and the broader Middle East far more now in 2013 than at any time before the historic events of 1990 and 91. Among the things that have changed since 1991 includes, of course, our memories of the Gulf War and our sense of what it meant. And this is the underlying point of the entire book, that what the Gulf War means to us 20 years, 20 plus years later, is not necessarily what it meant at the time. And by the same token, not what it will mean to people 20 years in the future and beyond. For as the great historian Herbert Butterfield told us more than 80 years ago, we, by which I mean both historians and the general public alike, we all, by virtue of the way our memories work, tend to recall the past, not in terms of what actually happened, but how things turned out. We tend to focus on what things meant to us, not what things meant to people at the time. Therefore, we can say quite quickly that the Gulf War was a conflict that was roundly understood, at least in American circles, as a tremendous victory in 1991. That interpretation changed a tad bit over the 1990s when it was considered a victory, yes, but perhaps an inconclusive victory, given that Saddam Hussein still remained in power. And of course, the conflict took on new meaning after 9-11, when it was perceived in many circles as but the first falling domino in a series of unexpected events. But none of these interpretations that came after that fact, after that time, truly capture what it meant to be at that time. The sense of anxiety, the sense of fear, 
the sense of moving into uncharted new territory and how that adventure might turn out or how badly. Such notions of contingency and uncertainty underlie each of the three major points which I wish to make tonight as we recall the Gulf War and ponder its ongoing meaning. <clears throat> and the points are these. First, that the Gulf War was a fundamentally transformative moment for the American engagement in the crucial yet volatile Middle East. Even before August of 1990, the Persian Gulf was largely beyond Washington's direct sphere of influence. It was an important region, don't get me wrong, but it was not yet one that the United States was the primary player. After 1990-91, I would argue that the United States became essentially another Gulf state. It became and remains the region's large, most important actor of all, all because of events that flowed from the decisions made in 1990 and 91. My second point tonight is that the Gulf War need not have been waged at all. Now, let me be clear on this point, lest you think I'm a conspiracy theorist. When I say that Washington need not have waged the Gulf War, I do not argue that Iraq could have been deterred from assaulting its neighbor in 1990. This is a popular interpretation, though one I think the facts prove to be wholly wrong. Neither do I mean when I argue that the Gulf War need not have been fight and waged at all, then occupied and annexed Kuwait could have been liberated without the use of force. Rather, I argue tonight that each of Washington's primary decisions at this time, the decision to confront Iraq with military force, the decision to liberate Kuwait with military force, the decision to defend Saudi Arabia with military force, the decision to initiate operations, military operations, even as Baghdad desperately sought to some way out of the crisis, and the decision to halt combat operations after the liberation of Kuwait, but before the total destruction of the Iraqi army, each of these were decisions. They didn't just happen. We know how they turned out, but there were choices made at the time. And the Bush administration could have made different choices. And my third point, therefore, elaborates on the first two, that American policymakers did not fight by reflex. There had to have been a reason that George Bush, a fundamentally cautious policymaker for whom the word prudence wasn't just a byword or even a catchphrase, but a way of life when he considered the international system. There had to be a reason why this cautious policymaker would risk the lives of so many and also risk his entire presidency to do something so audacious and utterly unprecedented. And there were reasons indeed. His White House and he, and the United States in turn, did not fight because it was anti-Arab, pro-Israel, or simply interested in the region's oil, though these have been popular criticisms, or frequent criticisms, I should say, over the last 20 years. These were popular interpretations, but they're wrong. I contend that the real reason why George Bush waged the Gulf War, and then more importantly waged it the way he did, was far more profound. He went to war, like so many presidents before him, in search of a better world. And my point, therefore, is nothing less than that the Gulf War marked a fundamental turning point, a pivot point, if you will, in modern American history. All that came before 1991, well, at least all before 1991, after 1945, you can understand in terms of the Cold War, but all that happened afterwards was something else entirely. Three points then, that the Gulf War was transformative, that it was contingent, and that it formed a clear dividing point in history. So let me turn to that first point, which begins immediately after Iraqi forces invaded Kuwait in August of 1990. When considering the Gulf War, we need recall that Washington could simply have let Hussein's aggression go. It could have done nothing as Kuwait, as Kuwait was swallowed up by its neighbor. In fact, many respected experts, including we now know within Bush's own inner circle, initially argued for just that position. Some argued, in fact, that the United States had no real allies in the region, only interests. And chief among those interests was ensuring the continued flow of Gulf oil to the world. Kuwait was no democracy and neither were any of its neighbors. These were nominally American allies, not because of ideology, but because they shared something in common. Put simply, in 1990, the Middle East mattered in global politics because of its oil. The world cared about the Gulf because it had oil, 
and Gulf states tolerated international interference in their affairs because foreigners bought the oil. And I hate to be so blunt, but I think anything else is sugarcoating the situation. And Saddam Hussein loved this arrangement. He loved it, in fact, so much he wanted to sell more oil to the world, more than his OPEC partners, including Kuwait, could condone. For you see, Saddam in 1990 had tremendous debts, largely a result of a nearly 10-year war with his neighbor Iran. His neighbors, the Kuwaitis especially, had enjoyed years of unbridled profits at the same time. And Saddam Hussein did not invade Kuwait in order to keep its oil from the world. On the contrary, he wanted to sell it to the world. He wanted to sell his oil and Kuwait's to pay off those debts. And the geopolitical realities of this situation prompted many in Washington, including in Bush's own inner cabinet, to respond with essentially studied indifference to the news that Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Now, they surely cared that it had happened. They just didn't know how much they really should care. For who cared, it was argued within the National Security Council, which flag was stamped on a barrel of oil that came out of the Gulf, so long as it came out of the Gulf. So long as a great Middle Eastern gas station was open for business, the Americans in the world could simply hold their nose and let the matter go away. Other options, of course, existed for how the world might deal with the Iraqi aggression. Washington could have accepted a so-called Arab solution, allowing regional players to solve the crisis without international interference. In fact, Egypt's Hosni Mubarak and Jordan's King Hussein each repeatedly lobbied President Bush over the telephone to, before, during, and after the Iraqi invasion to allow the Arab world to solve this problem on their own. We know this man, Mubarak told Bush. The Arabs, you see, have different rules, different ways, he said, of acting other than President Bush or other American leaders or other Western leaders might approve of. Mubarak and King Hussein told Bush time and again, let us handle this. We'll take care of the situation. After centuries of Western intervention and colonialism, they argued, the Arab world need to take care of its own. Now, Bush agreed to let his Arab friends give this a try for a while. He told Mubarak and Hussein that they could try for a negotiated deal, perhaps even one that would have led to a reduction in Kuwait's sovereignty, even as he instructed his own staff to seek further options. And there were, in fact, further options beyond the military course, which, of course, we'll turn to in due course. Perhaps the United States could have focused exclusively on economic sanctions as a way of driving Iraq from Kuwait. This was a particularly popular approach, it won't surprise you to know, in continental Europe. Or having chosen the military route, perhaps Bush could limit it to an air campaign. This was something Mikhail Gorbachev himself lobbied Bush to do. But we should recall, in fact, that George Bush was not the only decision maker in the world confronted by this problem. For Gorbachev, in fact, could have threatened to counter American force in the Middle East with his own, threatening that which had happened repeatedly during the Cold War in 1956 in 1973, again in the mid-1980s, Soviet leaders warned the United States against putting too much of their own interests in the Persian Gulf. Now, let's admit, Soviet intervention was unlikely in August of 1990, given Soviet poverty and the need of Gorbachev in particular to keep good relations with the West and with George Bush. But to say that it was unlikely is not the same to say it was impossible. For Iraq, you see, was a longtime client state of the Soviets, and it had advocates throughout Moscow and the Kremlin. More importantly, one fundamental Cold War dynamic had been that each superpower was wary of the other gaining too much influence over the crucial oil region of the Persian Gulf. And had that Baghdad invaded Kuwait five years earlier, I put to you, back in 1985, back in the era when Gorbachev had not yet been known in the West, when perestroika and glasnost were terms unknown, and only two years after Ronald Reagan had referred to the Soviets as the evil empire, had Saddam invaded at that time, we would have had a far more dangerous crisis. The Soviets, I think, would never have allowed the United States, under those earlier circumstances, to put more than half a million troops under arms along the Persian Gulf. Yet none of these alternative options came to pass, not appeasement, not economic sanction, not a renewal of Cold War tensions or even the Arab solution, for the fundamental reason that George Bush believed, or rather came to believe, that there was far more at stake in this crisis than merely Kuwait. 
To fully appreciate this plastic moment in history, I think we must recognize that Washington's engagement with the Gulf looked far different in 1991 and 90 than it does today. Before 1990, American warships routinely patrolled Gulf waters, but they had little presence in the ground following the Iranian Revolution of 1979 and the pullout from Lebanon a few years later. Washington held a limited defense agreement with Bahrain, but no one else. There were, for example, no US troops in Saudi Arabia in 1990, nor any formal pledge to defend that kingdom or Kuwait. In fact, on the eve of the Iraqi invasion, as tensions in the region grew, American policymakers put to each of the Gulf states the idea that perhaps this would be a good time for a joint military exercise. Let's show Saddam that we're in this together. Of all the Gulf states, only one, only one, the United Arab Emirates even agreed to this limited demonstration of solidarity. They feared more than Saddam a public backlash from cavorting with what the Iranians routinely called the Great Satan. And in fact, as Saddam Hussein directly told the United States ambassador before the invasion, quote, he felt secure, secure in the belief that no Arab government would ever allow the United States to lose, use their land for that purpose, defending Kuwait. Now, why was he so secure in his belief? Well, for two reasons. First, because in his view, Muslim states would reject the pollution of American troops on their soil. And second, because in practical terms, none to date had ever done so since 1979. Of course, the Shah of Iran had, but that was not a model that other Arab leaders wished to follow. Saddam therefore believed that Muslim states would reject, reject direct American aid, and more specifically the stationing of American troops on their soil. In retrospect, this was perhaps his worst strategic miscalculation, but it was hardly an irrational one. For American influence in the Persian Gulf was offshore rather than on site. This was not the 38th parallel in Korea. This was not the Fulda Gap in Germany places where American troops were stationed directly in harm's way as tripwires of American resolve. On the contrary, American policymakers for decades at this point had long hoped to influence the Gulf and keep its oil flowing with as little direct involvement as possible. So long as the Soviets didn't interfere in the region themselves, President Carter had declared in 1980. So long as the Iranians didn't stop up the Gulf, President Reagan declared a few years later, American planners were by and large content. Ultimately, it did not matter to cold warriors what happened so long as the oil continued to flow. And this was the Bush administration's first line as well, enunciated, in fact, a year before Saddam's invasion, enunciated in latter part of 1989 in National Security Directive 26, which laid out the full scope and rationale of American involvement in the region. This document, which you can get from Bob Holzweiss at the archive if you like, does not use the word freedom. It does not use the word democracy. It does not mention particular leaders. It doesn't talk about regi regime types. It doesn't talk about radical Islam. And it certainly doesn't mention WMDs. It says instead, quote, access to Persian Gulf oil is vital to national security interests, period. Memories of hostages in Iran destroyed barracks in Beirut, left reason enough to be wary of anything more. And this context matters for understanding the widespread American reluctance to do more in response to Iraq's invasion. For Hussein did not threaten, as I mentioned before, that long-range disruption of oil. Moreover, the Middle East was not a particularly appealing place for those in American politics with a sense of short and medium and long-term history. Take, for example, Secretary of State James Baker, who had at this point advised presidents for decades, excuse me, for years, but more importantly had been among Bush's closest friend for decades. He was Secretary of State, and upon hearing this news, contemplating it, getting back to Washington, he actually wasn't in Washington at the time, he pulled the president into the Oval Office, closed the door, and told him, quote, I know you're aware of the fact that this has all the ingredients that has brought down three of the last five presidents, a hostage crisis, body bags, and a full-fledged economic recession caused by $40 oil." End quote. Indeed, we need recall that Bush's decision to move American troops to the Gulf was hardly embraced across the board of American politics in 1990. 
just at the same time as we should recall that congressional opposition to the war was far from being partisan. It was rather conducted, I think, out of a true sense of concern. As Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell argued, the risks of active American intervention were great. He said, quote, these include an unknown number of casualties and deaths, billions of dollars spent, a greatly disrupted oil supply and oil price increases, a po war possibly widened to Israel, Turkey, or other allies, the possible long-term occupation of Iraq, increased instability in the Persian Gulf region, long-lasting Arab and American enmity, and a possible return to American isolationism." End quote. Looking back on Mitchell's warnings, we can see that few of those things occurred in the immediate aftermath of the Persian Gulf War, but that arguably all of Mitchell's fears, untold casualties, billions of dollars lost, disrupted markets, disaffected allies, Arab-American hostility, and a new wave of isolationism all returned in time to haunt the United States. These and similar fears were in fact present when the National Security Council first met on August 2nd of 1990 to discuss Iraq's invasion. And this discussion proved anything but decisive. Moreover, National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft later termed the session, quote, appalling. My fellow contributor to the book that we talk about tonight, Richard Haas, also a participant in that meeting, called it in his memoirs, quote, a sharp disappointment. Now, what Scowcroft found appealing, and Haas appalling, was that many of Bush's advisors appeared prepared to accept Iraq's conquest. Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, for one, urged Bush to declare Saudi Arabia a vital American national security interest, but by implication argued that Kuwait was not. Now let's face facts, Dick Cheney is not typically described as a pacifist or dove. He typically, over the course of his career, had no qualms about using American force in defense of American interests, but this was a moment where he simply did not see American interests at stake. In fact, Bush's war council didn't even seem to mind too much at first anyway, the prospect of Hussein coming to control up to one third of the world, world's proven oil supplies. If anything, his desire to sell might flood the market in fact, lowering oil prices back to those happy days of the early 1970s before the oil shocks. Hussein's invasion, in other words, might actually be good for American consumers. Indeed, the most significant worry that President Bush voiced out loud in that first meeting harkened back to earlier, I would argue, ingrained Cold War anxieties. He said, he told his staff, he warned them in fact, that the Soviets might react badly if the United States does anything to Iraq. And then he said, in a very interesting quote, we don't want to overlook the Soviet desire for access to warm water point, ports. In other words, he thought perhaps his friend, his new friend, his friend he still wasn't quite sure about, Mikhail Gorbachev had some role in this invasion. In sum, in the first hours and in fact days after the Iraqi invasion, Washington blinked, it stammered, it paused. This is not the image of decisive decision making typically recalled when memories of the Gulf War are thought of. We recall instead President Bush defiantly states declaring, this will not stand, this will not stand, this aggression against Kuwait. Yet frequently lost to our collective memory is the fact that this defiant statement happened five days after the Iraqi invasion. Five days, in fact, when the world, the country, and I'd argue, in fact, the majority of his staff wondered exactly what he would argue, what he would decide. And for historians, that tells us that other options were not only considered on the table, but were considered viable as well. And much occurred behind the scenes between the 1st and the 5th of August. In the interim, Scowcroft, Haas, and State Department colleague Lawrence Eagleburger won the president's endorsement of a more vigorous response. And here today, more than 20 years later, as we discuss the Gulf War history, I think we should be frank about what finally moved Bush to act. It was not the argument that Kuwaiti independence itself mattered much at all. Neither was it that Hussein's particular brand of evil and tyranny required an American response. Nor was Bush particularly persuaded that Iraq's aggression carried immediate strategic concerns or that Iraq might someday turn its oil wealth into dangerous weapons of mass destruction. Each of these reasons, in time, influenced Bush's thoughts, his actions, and his statements in the months to come. None, however, not freedom, evil, human rights, democracy, or WMDs, 
affected his thinking in those first fateful days of August. Bush was instead, and this is important, Bush was instead persuaded by the growing realization that he stood at a pivot moment in the course of history. And this is my second point for the evening. As Scowcroft explained in the second National Security Council meeting, after having time to collect his thoughts and marshal his arguments, quote, my personal judgment is that the stakes in this for the United States are such that to accommodate Iraq should not be a policy option. There is too much at stake, end quote. Scowcroft had earlier, in fact, made this point to President Bush in a far more intimate setting. When the two flew on a small plane to a small airfield in Aspen, the regular Air Force One being too large to land on that airfield, and to hear Scowcroft tell the story, their intimate quarters mattered in the president's decision making. For you have to picture he and the president and their immediate aides tucked so close tight together in a plane that their knees practically touched. Their papers flopped onto each other's laps and knees. And it was within this cramped space that the diminutive national security advisor leaned forward in his seat while making his point to the far larger and taller president, jabbing his finger every time he made a point, using his entire body, all that Scowcroft had, to make his case that the time for calculation based on narrow national interests was gone, that something larger and more important was afoot. And Eagleburger was equally dramatic, telling the National Security Council, quote, this is the first test of the post-war system. As the bipolar world is relaxed, it permits this, perhaps giving more flexibility because people might not be even worried about the involvement of the superpowers. If Saddam Hussein succeeds, others may try the same thing, and it would be a bad lesson. End quote. This argument persuaded Bush, who endorsed the fateful decision from which Washington's subsequent entanglements in the Middle East derived. And the key question, I think, is why. Why did Bush go against decades of American policy, injecting force into a region like none before? Answering that question takes me to my third and final point for this evening, why Bush acted. Not how or why we remember that he acted, but actually, at the moment, how he reached his decision. And I argue that Bush took this dramatic step within the Gulf crisis because he saw it as a bridge to a better world. His new world order, a phrase unveiled in response to Hussein's invasion, was not just a catchy phrase. It was rather the culmination of a long and difficult journey of intellectual discovery. Along with the majority of his national security team, Bush came late to the idea, in fact, that the Soviet transformations under Gorbachev could be trusted, that they were real. They came particularly late, I would argue, on the global scene to the realization that the Cold War was over. Even after the Berlin Wall fell in November of 1989 and democracy flowed behind the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe, Bush paused, fearing, among other things, a violent crackdown, such as he had just witnessed at Tiananmen Square. More profoundly, though, Bush recognized that the end of the Cold War eliminated the most stable aspect of the international system since 1945, and Bush, above all else, was a man enamored by international stability. Time and again, during the spring and summer of early of 1990, Bush told global leaders that their alliances required an enemy to survive. In his words, the new enemy was instability itself. A united Germany could not leave NATO, he told Helmut Kohl, because, quote, the enemy now is unpredictability, apathy, and destabilization. He told Britain's Margaret Thatcher that, quote, when I am asked who our enemy is now, I tell them apathy, complacency. In December of 1989, in fact, after meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev on the choppy seas off of Malta, Bush even lost his temper when pushed by reporters to declare the Cold War over because he simply did not know the answer to the next obvious and fundamental question. What came next? He said, and I quote, is the Cold War the same? I mean, is it raging like before in the times of the Berlin blockade? Absolutely not. Things have moved dramatically. But if I signal to you there's no Cold War, then it's what are you doing with those troops in Europe? I mean, come on. End quote. Bush saw in the Gulf War an opportunity as well as an invasion, a point that I'll make by way of conclusion tonight. He saw within it a chance to demonstrate that Washington would continue to lead no matter what the future might bring leading in particular towards the kind of world promised his generation as their reward for service in World War II. It would be a world, he said, quote, 
Will the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemates, is poised to fulfill its historic vision of its founders, end quote. Ultimately, this vision of a new world based on sovereignty and stability is what drove his thinking when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. In a similar vein, he said, the prospect of a global peace continues to depend on an American forward presence, end quote. And he told Gorbachev the exact same thing on the eve of the American air war, and then subsequently on the eve of the American ground wars, I'll tell you in a moment, that the liberation of Kuwait was not an end in itself, but something bigger. And Gorbachev, we should recall, attempted to mediate a truce between the world and Iraq. He did so twice, in fact. First, on the eve of the air war, and then a second time when the ground war appeared eminent. He called Bush repeatedly on the telephone during this later phase, in fact, hoping to save lives, hoping to save his former ally in Baghdad, and I think hoping as well to keep the world from seeing too vivid a demonstration of American potentially hegemonic power. One could fairly say, in fact, that Gorbachev called so often that he badgered Bush, hectoring him nightly with phone calls that grew well into the two hour plus range. Now this was not the brightest moment of their relationship. Uh, to be blunt, Bush was annoying the heck, or excuse me, Gorbachev was annoying the heck out of Bush. The president at this time was tired. He was stressed. He was about to send hundreds of thousands of soldiers into combat, risking more hundreds of thousands, civilians in the process. And he was frankly tired of Gorbachev's calls. So tired, in fact, that at one point he began yelling at Gorbachev. And he didn't stop. He yelled, and he yelled, and he yelled. Now, I have to tell you, it's typically hard from a transcript to determine when somebody's yelling for transcripts obviously don't reveal tone, and they certainly don't reveal volume. But in this case, we know that Bush lost his temper with the Soviet leader because we can read in that transcript Gorbachev saying repeatedly, again and again, calm down, George. George, calm down. Don't yell, George. Take it easy, George. Calm down, George. And Bush in time calmed. But his ultimate answer at that moment to Gorbachev was revealing. There would not be an early end to the Gulf War, he pledged, just that there would be no ongoing Soviet intervention. Because the Gulf War wasn't really the issue. At stake was the world to come, the better world, the post-Cold War world, the world in which aggressors learned not to invade. Where the UN looked over sovereignty and the United States and its allies, the Soviet Union potentially included, looked out for the peace. As Bush told Gorbachev, in a line that, to my mind, sums up the president's entire reason for waging and ultimately winning the Gulf War, now a full generation ago, a line uttered at the height of the Gulf War itself, when coalition bombs and missiles rained down in Iraq, he told Gorbachev, quote, let us not fall out over Iraq. Let us not divide ourselves over Saddam Hussein. After all, there are far bigger things than this conflagration which is going to be over very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Engler. Now, I'm going to ask two other people to join us on stage. And first of all, I would like to have uh, Larry Knapper uh, join us on stage. Ambassador Larry Knapper graduated from Texas A&M University in 1969. Where's the who? Look, all right, all right. He's a career foreign service officer who served his country as ambassador to Latvia in Kazakhstan. At the time of Desert Shield and Desert Storm, he was the deputy chief of missions in Romania, where he received the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award for leadership of the embassy during the overthrow of Kochesko. Next, I'd like to ask Lieutenant General Randy House to join us. General House graduated from Texas A&M University in 1967 and received a regular Army commission in the infantry. He has commanded at every level in peace and war, from platoon leader to deputy commander, U.S. Pacific Command. During Desert Shield, Desert Storm, he commanded the 22nd Brigade, Blackjack Brigade, in the 1st Cavalry Division. Lieutenant General House's 
Brigade executed the coalition's deception plan against Saddam Hussein's army making multiple bloody incursions up the Wadi al-Batin prior to the start of the ground operations. These actions deceived the Iraqis into believing the coalition would attack from the south in the vicinity of Wadi. So we look forward to this discussion. We have people who were there and people who had studied what happened there. So let's go into the desert. Well, I believe uh, we're waiting for your questions. So there are microphones on either side of the uh, aisles. Uh, and if you don't ask a question, I'm going to tell you about all the cool things coming out of the archive. <laughs> <laughs> that inspires me. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I don't have a chart, but we've had many arguments, so this will be a verbal one. Uh, I use this map when I teach uh, about the Gulf War, and I compare it to Operation Iraqi Freedom. And one of the big differences is between both wars are the war aims. So I'm wondering if we agree with your interpretation that President Bush had this vision. Bipolarity is ending, unipolarity is coming. We're going to have a freer hand in places like the Middle East. But we also want to set precedents for how we should do business. Was he constrained in his objectives in order to maintain the coalition? Did that play out when you looked at the archives? Was there a, a definite decision that you can only do so much with so many allies? Well, I will uh, answer that first since you directed it to me, but I'm curious to hear what our uh, fellow panelists have to say. Um, I think Bush was constrained in two important ways, and then also there's an important thing which has come out of the archive, to my mind, that helps explain his ultimate decision making, not in terms of the decision to go to war, but the decision to end the war. Uh, clearly, he was constrained by the concerns of the Israeli-Arab dynamic. Now, of course, Israel is not a member of the coalition, but many of the members of the coalition, shall we say, were not fond of the Israelis. Uh, consequently, he was constrained in the need to keep the war from going on long enough that the Israelis would want to retaliate for being hit by Saddam Hussein. And at the same time, be, uh, harken back to what I mentioned earlier about the desire among many within the Middle East for an Arab solution, he was concerned that if he went further towards Baghdad and, in fact, took over Baghdad and deposed Saddam Hussein by force, that this would create greater enmity within the coalition among his Arab members who would view that in some way as, as a reestablishment of, of Western colonialism. But there's a very important distinction here, which I'd like to make that I, that I think was a, a revelation to me within the archives, and that there has always been a question when the decision comes, when the decision comes up, when the, question, the study of the decision comes up about whether or not American forces should have continued on to Baghdad in 1991. This was not a discussion within the White House for a very important reason. That the ultimate goal, or one of the ultimate goals, beyond the liberation of Kuwait, was uh, the removal of Saddam Hussein from power. There was a 100% certainty on the part of high-level American officials that this was going to happen anyway. Saddam Hussein had been embarrassed. His own people were rising up against him. His own army was out to get him. Uh, his, if he lived weeks, it would be a shock instead of days. 999 times out of 1,000, I think that's exactly how things would have played out, that Saddam would not have survived. Uh, unfortunately, from the Bush administration's perspective, George H.W. Bush's perspective, uh, Saddam rolled the dice and, and made it. Uh, but I think given that the question and those odds again, I suspect they would take the same bet again. I, I do think the, uh, the breadth of the uh, coalition uh, did, does, did play a role in, in that uh, calculation. It was in many ways a strange calculation. My vantage point, uh, or uh, uh, coalition, my vantage point on it was uh, from uh, Romania where uh, only a few months before, in December 1989, Ceausescu had been overthrown in, in the only violent overthrow uh, that occurred in, in uh, Eastern Europe uh, after the fall of the wall. Ceausescu had been, uh, and Romania, had been uh, a, a big ally of uh, Saddam Hussein and, and also uh, of Iran. 
So, and his successors, uh, Ceausescu's successors, uh, there, and uh, came out of, many of them came out of the, the sort of Communist Party uh, apparatus. They were not uh, Ceausescu's closest associates, but they were nonetheless uh, communists. Now, why was Romania important anyway? Well, it was because Romania just happened to have one of the rotating seats on the Security Council. So they had a vote, and we needed nine votes every time the Security Council took a resolution. So um, the, we, need, we, really, we really needed uh, even the support of, of Romania and its successors uh, w at a time when the United States didn't like an awful lot of the things that they were, in fact, doing. So keeping uh, a coalition that broad uh, and that deep on board uh, I, I think did have uh, something to say about narrowing and constraining objectives. I was a colonel at the time, and um, was, while all this discussion was going on, I was focused on running off guard and running off tackle, you know, down at the, at the fundamental level. I had been, uh, the two years before um, the Gulf War, I'd been on the Joint Staff and I'd been the exec to the director of three Joint Chiefs of Staff and was there for General Powell's first six months. And the, the whole thing uh, at the time, uh, we were this close to the SINC, the Commander-in-Chief of CENTCOM being an admiral. Um, it, it went down, it was between the uh, two three stars uh, it was between Schwarzkopf, who was the op step of the Army, and a Navy three-star admiral. Because the, at the time, it was all about the tanker wars. And that's all we had been doing. So there was no, there was no thought. Uh, we had no war plan. You know, the, the America has plans for more contingencies than you can imagine. There was no contingency plan. There was no... Uh, 1021, 10, 1021 was, was, was all about the Soviet Union. Uh, so, you know, it was uh, the thought of a ground war in that region at this time, uh, even to a colonel, was unbelievably uh, remote. My question is to uh, Ambassador uh, Napper and General House, and that is, are you buying the Kool-Aid this man is dishing out? <laughs> uh, he, he reminded us at the very beginning of his talk about George Herbert Walker Bush being a prudent, careful, cautious political leader. And then he tells us that he had a vision for a new world order. He was ready to risk an enormous amount because he saw the stakes in this so much bigger than Saddam Hussein. It, General House, didn't we expect Saddam Hussein to use chemical weapons? Didn't we? What were your estimates about casualties? Can you really believe that we were ready to throw the dice that this leader was going to take? Ambassador Napper, is this your understanding of the man for whom this library is constructed? Go ahead, sir. <laughs> can, I, can I interject, if I may? Sure. Let me just say that uh, it seems to we me We should let the Kool-Aid vendor yeah. defend himself first. <laughs> I just want to point out that uh, if only one of the three of us agrees on this panel, I'm still batting 333 and I get into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> so, okay. Well, um, I guess I'm uh, at least partly persuaded uh, by the argument. I do think uh, that uh, notwithstanding uh, President Bush's uh, reputation for prudence, that he also did uh, have uh, a broader vision about the way he wanted uh, the world <coughs> Uh, to look after his uh, administration. And I, and I do think that uh, the, the Iraqi use of aggressive force to accomplish its objectives sort of violated that notion of uh, what the post-war post 
uh, Cold War world uh, might look like. So um, I do think that there were other proximate uh, objectives. They were uh, very much concerned about the defense of Saudi Arabia. I mean, that was a huge, uh, a huge stake uh, that was uh, seemed to be called into question by the by the invasion. I'm not so sure that uh, they would have been uh, so sanguine about uh, uh, Saddam Hussein controlling that larger percentage of the of the world's uh, oil supply. That in fact it might make a difference. You know, who controlled uh, that that particular uh, spigot. I am also persuaded by the argument that, uh, that President Bush was concerned that uh, this set of events not completely unravel, and if possible, to validate everything that he had invested uh, in, a, uh, had come to invest. And I agree there was a pause while he reconsidered his relationship with Gorbachev. But that after Malta, uh, he had become to come to an in invest something in this relationship. Um, to uh, finally, once and for all, uh, end the Cold War. So um, I think there were many proximate uh, objectives that he saw in the, in the diplomacy of the uh, Persian Gulf, uh, first Persian Gulf War. But I, I am at least persuaded uh, that part of it, part of his calculation, was that something had to come out of this that would mean a better world in the long, in the long run. He had to have a way to answer that news conference question, what comes next? And what came next came an international coalition working together across all kinds of divides and divisions that would be uh, strong enough, durable enough, to turn back aggression at a very critical juncture. Sir, the, um, the context that you lose after you know all the what happened <coughs> was um, after we had gotten out of Vietnam. The, we had been invo involved in a in a uh, little island fight that wasn't much, and then we had been involved in Just Cause, taking down Noriega and Panama. Um, when I got to the Gulf with my brigade in September of '90. And I, all we knew we were going to defend Saudi Arabia. Um, matter of fact, in October of 90, we started plans to build camps like we had in Germany on the Fulda Gap. I saw at one time, and while all this was going on in Washington, you know, I never, was, I never saw TV and never listened to any radio. I mean, I'm out there in the desert. Nobody had been there since Jesus Christ. There was no Bedouins. <laughs> you know, there was no Bedouins. There was no camels. There was no nothing where we were. <laughs> there was no trails. There were no roads. There were no towns. And, and I could see us just sitting there like we had in the full of the gap in Europe, uh, you know, forever. So we, we started laying out plans to build camps, to build ranges to the Glaffenwehr, it was a whole, you know, so um, it, you just kind of had to understand the context at my level of, of, of where we were. We, uh, you know, after Vietnam, I had, I had uh, after two tours of Vietnam, I'd lived through, you know, 20 years of <coughs> how bad, you know, it was to be a soldier, you know, because we had done all these terrible things in Vietnam. And so then, the only thing I knew was when we went to the Gulf War, we were so good, and the Reagan dollars and, 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 and what had happened to America's military after Vietnam, I remember being asked after the war by several think tank groups that came in to talk to me. They says, did you, it was about fratricide. It says, did you care, did you, did you worry uh, about where the enemy was? Uh, did you know where the enemy was? Did you know where, I said, I didn't care. I just wanted to know where the friendlies were because I knew I could beat any enemy that we ran into. So it, the, the context at the time was so, uh, has been lost uh, of, of where we were and what was going on at the different levels and um, 
you know, never seeing any of these briefings, you know, never seeing uh, any of these briefings, September, October, November, you know, we didn't really know um, we were going to attack Iraq until sometime in December. All of our plans were defensive. We were defending Saudi Arabia. And it wasn't until sometime in December that we started working now at Schwarzkopf's level, at, you know, at Colin Powell's level, at the, they, were, you know, they were into offensive war planning, but not at, not at my level. So it, it just, uh, um, I don't know if it's drinking the Kool-Aid or just not quite uh, understanding what, what was going on at, when you're a colonel, it's hard to envision what goes on at the President of the United States' mind, okay? <laughs> you just, you know, I just ran off guard and ran off tackle. <laughs> I'm going to accept both of those as vivid endorsements. <laughs> so, uh.